Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for the Starlight Capital 2021 Outlook uh, for Global Real Assets webcast featuring Starlight Capital CEO and CIO Dennis Mitchell, Infrastructure Portfolio Manager Varun Anand, and Real Estate Associate Portfolio Manager Michelle Wearing. Dennis Mitchell joined Starlight Capital in March 2018 as CEO and CIO. He has over 15 years of experience in the investment industry and was previously Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of Century Investments. Dennis has managed over $2 billion in real asset mutual funds, including the largest real estate mutual fund in the country. Dennis is a multiple winner of the Brendan Wood International Top Gun Awards for both individual and team achievements and oversaw an award-winning investment team with over $18 billion in assets under management. Varun Anand joined Starlight Capital in September 2018 as Portfolio Manager, Infrastructure. Varun has more than 10 years of experience in the financial services industry with over seven years of experience, experience managing publicly listed infrastructure assets. He joined Starlight Capital as a Portfolio Manager from CI Signature, where he focused exclusively on global infrastructure investments, totaling more than 5 billion across several mandates. Michelle, joined, Michelle Wearing joined Starlight Capital in September 2018 as Associate Portfolio Manager, Real Estate. She has over 11 years of business and investment experience, primarily in real estate. Michelle recently held a position with TD Securities, where she served as an associate in equity research covering Canadian REITs and REOCs. Prior to that, she held various positions at KPMG in consumer markets and valuations. Welcome, Dennis, Varun, and Michelle. Our format today will begin with a prepared presentation, followed by a question and answer session. If you have questions for any of our speakers, please click on the Q&A button located at the bottom center of your screen. I would now like to turn things over to Mr. Dennis Mitchell. Well, thank you, Lou, and welcome to everybody who's joined us on this call. Before we get started, I wanna acknowledge the fact that we're in the midst of a global pandemic. As part of tonight's presentation, we'll refer to the pandemic in mainly economic terms. And in some instances, we'll refer to the benefits of the pandemic on the performance of our companies. But we, I want to take a moment right now to acknowledge the fact that for many Canadians, the impact of the global pandemic is not some sort of economic exercise, but a real threat to their health and their livelihood. And so for those who have taken the time to join us on the call tonight, who have been directly impacted by the uh, effects of the global pandemic, on behalf of Starlight Investments and Starlight Capital, I want to let you know that um, we convey our deepest sympathies and condolences to you, and you're in our thoughts. I'll begin today's from tonight's presentation by speaking about our global market outlook. I'll talk to you about our outlook for real assets, and then I will defer to first Varun Anand and then Michelle Weering to talk specifically about the global infrastructure market and our funds and our performance, and uh, then the global real estate market, um, our funds and their performance. So beginning with our global market outlook, uh, again, the coronavirus pandemic has been the single most important factor driving performance of all markets from equity to fixed income to currencies. And speaking specifically about the equity markets and real assets, the pandemic has led to sharp increases in unemployment and bankruptcies. And we're seeing that Im impact continue even today as companies uh, as diverse as from Boeing to 3M to Disney, airlines, uh, hotel chains, all announce either bankruptcies or layoffs or combinations of those things. In response, federal governments have implemented various fiscal stimulus measures to bridge the gap between economic output before the pandemic and a return to normal after widespread vaccination occurs, hopefully sometime in 2021. The left-hand side chart economic outlook projections shows you the impact on GDP growth in 2020 and the anticipated recovery in 2021. On the right hand side under global GDP projections, you can see uh, in November 2019, you can see the OECD's projections for 2020. And then the blue line, sorry, I should say the green line here shows you their November 29 projections for 2020. And the blue line here shows you the base case scenario now with upside and downside scenarios. However, we progress from September of 2020 onward. The estimation is that we are going to lose about $7 trillion US of economic production as a result of the global pandemic. Uh, one thing I will note is that the new US administration represents an opportunity to capture some of that $7 trillion back. 
as we would imagine that that new administration will probably support increased global trade activity. If you recall in 2017, one of the first acts that President Trump undertook was to withdraw the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, re the resumption or the addition of the United States to that trade agreement would go a long way towards boosting global trade, which has been one of the key drivers of GDP growth uh, for the last two decades. Now, speaking about fiscal stimulus, um, it is absolutely crucial that governments around the world uh, commit to fiscal stimulus to bridge the gap between pre-pandemic economic output and that return to normal activity given to us by widespread vaccination. Countries that are able to implement more fiscal stimulus will be able to supplement household income and corporate revenues and allow their recoveries to take place more rapidly and to be more robust. The charts you see here under real household income, I'll, I'll highlight four countries in particular. You can see Canada, the green lines on this chart represent household income and the blue lines on these charts represent GDP. And you can see in Canada, despite the collapse of GDP growth because of the pandemic, household incomes actually accelerated. And a similar chart exists for the United States. This is a function of them writing checks to households and, and direct monetary transfers to households. You can see that GDP growth still collapsed below 2007 levels in Canada. That's a function of our reliance on energy and the impact of oil early in the year and then accelerated as the pandemic took hold. I also point out the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom made news earlier this week by being the first country to approve the, Vi the Pfizer vaccine on an emergency use authorization. Uh, the pessimist in me points this chart out as why their accelerate the reason behind their accelerated uptake of the va of the vaccine. You can see that the UK doesn't have the fiscal capacity to stimulate their domestic economy and has done very little to do so. And so the dramatic decline in GDP growth has been largely uncushioned with fiscal stimulus from the federal government. The only country to be in worse shape is Italy, and we would argue that Italy was deteriorating before the pandemic. And they were one of the first nations to be forced to implement ruling, you know, for national lockdowns because of their poor response uh, and the quick spread of the virus through Italy. So looking at those four countries, you can see the impact that fiscal stimulus has had on preserving GDP growth and, well, sorry, in this case, preserving real household income. I mentioned unemployment um, rising dramatically. The other point that I would make about the impact of unemployment driven by the pandemic is the fact that it has hit disproportionately segments of the population that have a higher propensity to consume. Canada, the United States, Japan, these are all very mature global economies and as a result are skewed towards domestic consumption for GDP growth. Anything that impacts domestic consumption has a disproportionate impact on GDP growth. Uh, to give you an example, someone making $30,000 a year is spending the lion's share of what they take home after tax for food, shelter, utilities, medicine. An extra $1,000 of income from that uh, earned by that person is in all likelihood going to be spent as opposed to saved. Contrast that with someone making $300,000 a year. The incremental $1,000 of income to that person, there's a higher propensity for that to actually be saved in, you know, whether it's an RSP or a TFSA or what have you. And so the chart on the left shows you the impact of the pandemic. The clear diamond shapes here show you where unemployment was for these various groups in the G7 in February of this year. So looking at this chart here, this segment of the chart, you can see that unemployment in the G7 was about 4% in February that jumped to almost twice that level in June and didn't make much, Im much improvement in July. And if you look at the various subgroups, women, men, 25 plus, you can see they're all very similar to all. I highlight the 15 to 24 age category here because this is again, a category of people who have a higher propensity to spend as opposed to invest. And so you can see unemployment began much higher for this group and certainly spiked to an even higher rate and uh, hasn't improved dramatically from June through July. This has a disproportionate impact on GDP growth globally. Uh, and you can see the impact on household spending across those countries as you know, from April to June to July as well. Uh, and another point that I'll make on this slide, just speaking specifically about the US, there have been 63 million jobless claims in the US this year. And some of that is people who are laid off, 
then rehired for various reasons, and then secondarily laid off, right? So the 63 million is inflated slightly. But if we just look at since July, when the Paycheck Protection Program money was fully exhausted and dispensed, there's still been 7.4 million jobless claims since then. So unemployment is a real side, it was a huge side effect of the pandemic. And one of the things that will drag, will cause the recovery to be lagged. So where does that leave us in terms of interest rates? Sorry, where does that leave us in terms of interest rates and inflation? Well, the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States has already gone on record with their forward guidance to say that they are going to keep the Fed funds rate at zero through the end of 2022. Now, that first pledge was made assuming that there would be significant fiscal stimulus coming from Congress in the United States. We anticipated a fourth stimulus package in August, September of, of this year. And as of today, December, we still haven't gotten that fourth fiscal stimulus package. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Federal Reserve updated their forward guidance either later this month or early next month and push this um, forward guidance out to the end of 2023. This first chart here, US federal funds rate shows you the neutral rate for the Fed funds rate and the actual path of the Fed funds rate. And for, for those who aren't aware of what the neutral rate is, it is the Fed funds rate that neither increases nor decreases inflation hence neutral. Historically, when the Fed has hiked the actual Fed funds rate higher than the neutral rate, it has induced a recession. And you can see that in 2001 and 2008, 2009, or sorry, 2006, 2007. It was hoped that we had avoided that cycle this time around as the Fed started hiking in 2015, sorry, 2016, and continued to do so into late 2018. Uh, but the pandemic, of course, spurred the most recent recession that we've experienced. When we look at long bond yields, in the depths of the financial crisis in 08 and 09, 10-year bond yields in the United States troughed at just over 2%. And we said, wow, historically low interest rates. Then, you know, in 2011 through 2012, we, we crashed through 2% and, and tested one and a half and retest, sorry, and, and hit one and a half. And we tested that level again in 2016. Well, fast forward to today, and we are below 1% in terms of long bond yields in the United States. And if we start factoring in yield curves in Switzerland, in Germany, in Japan, a significant portion of sovereign bonds uh, from two to out to 30 years are below zero. So long bond yields globally are at historic lows and remain so. Now, Moving to US core PCE, PCE stands for personal consumption expenditures and it is the measure of inflation that the Fed uses when it sets the Fed funds rate. And the target is 2% and you can see going back to sort of mid 2015 or 2015, you can see that it's consistently been below that target. If we look at what's happened this year, it plunged as the United States started to shut down uh, the various states economies in response to the pandemic. And I would argue that this rapid increase in inflation midway through the year was not a function of increased economic pricing and not a function of households paying more, sorry, not a function of households having the capacity to pay more for goods. It was a function of an artificial curtailment of supply with you know, production being shut in with various um, areas of the economy being shut down entirely. There was a huge curtailment of supply um, and demand certainly was cut as well but the curtailment in supply is what really has driven the increase in PCE. And you can see that it's already moderated, but even on the way up, it came nowhere close to matching, you know, meeting the 2% threshold. And the Fed has gone on record a number of times to say that, of course, the joys of uh, live Zoom casts, the Fed has gone on record to say that uh, they will allow PCE to run above 2% for an extended period of time as they let the economic recovery catch hold. So just uh, speaking, so to summarize, our expectation is that global growth is going to remain low and below potential. We expect interest rates and inflation to remain modest as well. And looking at upside and downside risks to that, that scenario, it really does come down to COVID-19 and the pandemic. If we can roll out the vaccines and the therapies in a timely manner and get widespread uh, vaccination done, then we would expect the economic recovery to take relatively, to take hold relatively sooner and for the economic recovery to be faster and more robust. On the downside, 
we are really on the cusp of second and, and tertiary waves across the United States and Europe. And so if we can't manage the rollout of vaccines and therapies, and if we can't encourage responsible social behavior to limit the spread, then the recovery will take that much longer and be that much weaker. So what does that mean for real assets? The first thing I would say is that real assets provide an essential service to large portions of the population in a supply constrained manner. Uh, so that essential nature of the services provided creates a, a structural long-term growth trend in the revenues and cash flows of real assets. Added to that are a number of long-term structural macro trends that are driving increased top line revenue and, and resulting cash flow growth in real assets. Things like e-gaming, social media, streaming, e-commerce, um, the, increased, the uh, increased aging of the population, the tendency of, for all of us to live longer, but in contrast also the rise of various mor morbidities, case in point, COVID-19. The trend towards ESG, particularly environmental, increased urbanization, the trend to rising immigration in mature countries. All of these longer term trends are driving the performance of various subsectors in the real asset space, whether it be renewable energy, managed lanes, single family home REITs, industrial REITs, all of these macro trends are driving top line revenue and resulting bottom line cash flow growth in real assets. The other thing that real assets provides is extremely tax efficient cash flows. So if we look at some of the income options for Canadian investors in this country, high yield bonds, common equities, preferred equities, uh, and then we look at real estate, SCGR is the Starlight Global Real Estate Fund, SCGI is the Starlight Global Infrastructure Fund. The nominal yields that can be achieved are, are similar in some cases, preferred equities and high yield bonds nominally yield more than what we offer in our real estate and infrastructure fund. But when we factor in the tax efficiency of these distributions, you can see that the after-tax yield advantage that real assets have over preferred equities, common equity, and high yield bonds. You, you know, using tax rates in Ontario, you would have to find equities yielding about eight or 9% or bonds yielding about 12 or 13% to match the after-tax yield generated by our real estate and our infrastructure funds. And when you're looking at it on an absolute basis, you know, a, a similar $100,000 investment, you can see the huge after-tax yield advantage. In 2019, in our global real estate and global infrastructure fund, over 80% 80 over 80 of the distribution that we paid was treated as return of capital for tax purposes. And so that's what accounts for the extremely low tax rate attributed to the income from these two funds. And that income has got positive slope. And by that, I mean, in 2019, both funds experienced over 30 distribution increases from the companies that we own in those funds and the increases averaged well over 6%. So not just high recurring monthly income from these investments, and we pay these distributions on a monthly basis, but extremely high tax efficiency that we believe we can replicate in 2020 as well. Now, the rising distributions are a function of rising cash flows, but to illustrate the impact of rising cash flows and dividends, this is Ned Davis data here and goes back to 1972, so a good 50 years of data. And what it shows you is that when you break the S&P down into you know, subsectors, those companies that have track records of growing their dividends or initiating dividends have significantly outperformed the S&P 500 as a whole. And not only have they outperformed, but they've done so with less risk and less volatility. You know, there's an old saying, you know, a bank robber was asked why he robbed banks and he said, that's where the money is. Well, it makes sense that if you're looking to find companies that outperform, and if you want to build a portfolio that outperforms, you should start by populating it with companies that have a history of outperforming. And so, hence my, my speaking on this slide about the number of distribution increases we've received, this is why that strategy is a winning strategy and makes sense. Now, in addition to having portfolios full of companies that are growing their cash flows, uh, we have got a proprietary investment strategy that allows us to differentiate our performance from that of our competitors. So whether it's the Starlight Global Infrastructure Fund or the Starlight Global Real Estate Fund, you can see from October of 2018 to October of this year, our upside capture is greater than 100% and our downside capture is less than 70% on the infrastructure side and less than 80% on the real estate side. 
So huge differentials where we're giving more than 100% of the upside and less than 100% of the downside. And that is a function of our investment philosophy. You can see our active share here, meaning our portfolios look nothing like their benchmarks. The infra fund is at 93% in terms of active share and the real estate fund is at 87% in terms of active share. So real value add through active management. So just to summarize our thoughts on real asset returns for 2021, low global GDP growth, inflation and long bond yields should continue to create a favorable environment for real assets. Quality businesses with growth in cash flows and distributions, those should remain the key performance factors for 2021. As we return to normal in the second half of 2021, valuation will start to be a bigger factor in performance and stock selection will be that much more additive to, um, to alpha. The resilient distribution growth that you get out of real assets is a function of the fact that they provide essential services. They have contractual revenues and expenses that provide a high level of visibility into recurring cash flows. And I've already talked about the tax efficiency of those cash flows. And then because they provide that essential service, it leads to long-term growth in compounding. I already articulated the global macro trends that support that longer term capital and compounding. So when you put it all together, you're going into 2021 with sort of four to 5% yields out of this sector. And you're looking for compounding because of the essential nature of their services they provide of sort of three to 5% as well. So at the end of 2021, we're expecting high single digit to very low double digit total returns out of the space as a function of all of the attributes that I just covered. Now with that, I wanna to yield to my, uh, my colleagues beginning with Varun Anand um, and Varun will take you through uh, 2020, the Global Infrastructure Fund, the changes that we made. He'll talk to you about some of the companies that we own, and then we'll move to Michelle Weering on the real estate side of things. So Varun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dennis. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in today and to echo Dennis's sentiments. I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy during this time. Uh, obviously, it's very challenging for a number of people across the country. So uh, best wishes to everybody who's navigating this pandemic just as we are. So 2020 has been a crazy year and uh, that has obviously trickled down to how we've managed the portfolio. And in terms of changes we've made, it's really been a function of uh, making changes before, during and after uh, you know, the peak of the crisis. So with respect to things we did before, um, there's two areas where we reduced our exposure and that was energy and airports. With energy, it was really just about a mismatch that we saw between the demand curve and the supply coming online. We did see some demand destruction materializing in the early days uh, of the COVID crisis in China. And more importantly, we saw supply coming online in 2020. Not only is it uh, due to the shale uh, evolution in the US, but also because of countries like Libya, where you had suppressed output that was eventually gonna to return to the market. Secondly, with airports, the uh, thesis was actually fairly simple in that Chinese travelers are a big driver of profitability for airports, especially those in Europe and Australia. And when the uh, pandemic obviously hit and we started seeing lockdowns in China as well as uh, movement decline, that was where we decided to actually reduce our exposure completely to airports because we didn't really see a reason to own them when valuations weren't that reasonable. And also we had seen historically how uh, demand drops off quite dramatically and then subsequently does rebound. Of course, when we got into March, April and May, we saw that the COVID-19 crisis went well beyond China and actually impacted the entire world. So our thesis changed from not only being concerned about China, but to be, being concerned about air travel everywhere. And remember, even though domestic travel has improved thus far this year, the most lucrative component of air travel is international long haul business. And that is still down more than 90%. So when we look at a lot of these names which have rallied in November after the vaccine news and the rotation, uh, we think that rally has really been driven more by hope rather than actual fundamental improvement. And that's why we remain on the sidelines. In terms of ch changes we made during the peak of the crisis, like in March and May, uh, sorry, March and April, the first was increasing our exposure to renewable energy. And the reason for that is, when we saw days where there was intraday drops of 10 or 15% on names like Borelex or Northern Power, we were kind of scratching our heads because we didn't understand why a renewable energy name would get beat up that badly when they have contracted cash flows with investment grade counterparties and a lot of them have non-recourse debt. And what I mean by that is 
the cash flows from a solar farm or a wind farm, let's say they don't meet and they don't make their payments, the creditors can only go after the assets in that particular farm. They cannot go after the parent company. And that in and of itself provides a lot of defense and protection against insolvency risk. And the reason why renewable energy companies get that, those favorable debt terms is because they're very low volatility assets. The sun is the biggest input to a solar farm and the wind is the biggest input to a wind farm. Both of those inputs are free and unlimited. And that really has shown itself through the results of these companies this year, where companies that we own within the renew renewable energy space have actually met or exceeded earnings expectations for the last two quarters, and many of them have added to the growth pipeline. And in terms of uh, an area where we've actually been adding before, during, and after the peak of the crisis is infrastructure technology. And that refers to sectors like data centers, uh, payment processors, cellular towers. And the reason why we are kind of adding throughout the year is because we like these companies in terms of the secular trends that are driving growth behind them things like cloud computing, things like 5G, and those trends have actually been accelerated as a consequence of COVID-19. And as a result, we're seeing additional years of visibility on growth, and at the same time, uh, less pricing pressure than we've seen historically, given the overwhelming demand these industries are facing. So to refer to a few specific names that have contributed to our performance this year, the first is NextDC. This is Australia's largest pure play data center, up about 70% on the year. And thus far, despite the COVID-19 crisis, they've added uh, to the growth uh, opportunities across three different campuses in Australia. And their customers are not only enterprises, but they're also the largest and most powerful companies in the world, namely Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And we'd like to invest in companies where your counterparts have very strong balance sheets and are aggressively expanding. The second is Solaria Energy, and this probably is not a name that's very familiar to most of the audience. And the reason for that is that it's a Sp Spanish pure play solar company. And this was a name we actually bought in March because, to be quite frank, it's always been expensive and I didn't like paying up for too much of that future growth. But March provided an opportunity to actually uh, leg into the name. And uh, the name has done phenomenally well, up about 190% this year. And as a result, we have taken some money off the table because that valuation now is taking away from what we consider an attractive risk reward opportunity. But for, for the year of 2020, it definitely did serve to help our performance. The third is CargoJet, and I'm sure it's a name that many of you are familiar with, uh, Canada's largest air cargo transportation company. And this is, again, another example of an infrastructure company that has benefited from the increase in e-commerce related to people staying at home and just secular changes in the way we purchase goods. So CargoJet has absolutely smashed expectations on earnings, EBITDA, revenue, any metric you pick. They've, they've gone well above their expectations for this year. And just last week, they announced that they're going to have the busiest holiday season they've ever had. And they've actually added a new plane to their fleet. And that really speaks to the growth opportunity for this company. And in a scenario where we have a massive vaccine rollup next year, you're going to need companies like CargoJet to transport that vaccine, especially given the temperature sensitivity that it has. And then lastly is Cellnex, and this is one of Europe's largest wireless telecommunications and broadcast infrastructure providers. And again, was one of those names where it's always been expensive, but in March, we got the opportunity to buy it. And they've not only executed on organic growth, but they've also done a number of deals this year, most recently acquiring CK Hutchinson's portfolio of towers in Europe for more than $10 billion and adding to their exposure in a number of their key markets. Next slide, Dennis. Perfect. So this is a snapshot of the fund, and um, I'll, I'll kind of tackle the things where you see a bit of a discrepancy uh, between geographic or sector allocation. And starting with geography, you'll notice that we're much higher weight on United States and Canada. And that's really a function of two things. In the United States, you have more opportunity to invest in infrastructure technology companies because a lot of them are domiciled there. And that's not a sector that's widely available for Canadian investors in Canada. And even within Europe and other areas of the world, there's not as many companies. With a Canadian overweight, that's really a function of us finding a lot of high quality renewable energy companies in Canada. And when I spoke about Solaria, while that's done phenomenally well this year, the valuation has got a bit stretched. When we look at the Canadian names, we think the valuation is actually a little bit more reasonable. And that's why we think it's an advantage being domiciled here and having good uh, access to uh, management teams where we're not necessarily paying up for the next 10 years of growth. And we still see, <clears throat> excuse me, a strong pipeline for a number of our names. 
The next thing I'll say is that the cash and casual equivalents is a higher at 13%. And that's really just a function of some lumpiness of cash flows. So we are a young fund, but we've been fortunate to have inflows this year. And sometimes they come in big checks. And as a result, we don't like to deploy it all at once, uh, given some of our names are a little bit more liquid and it makes a little bit more sense for us to gradually deploy that capital. But in an ideal setting, we would be closer to the 5% mark. And the, third, the th uh, last thing I'll touch on is you'll see we're, we're heavily underweight Europe relative to the benchmark. And the reason for that is, you know, Europe was in a precarious financial position even before COVID. And now that has been exacerbated by obviously the impacts of COVID. And in November, a lot of our European names were up about 30, 35%. And we took the opportunity to trim those positions because we think valuations have got a little bit ahead of themselves. So Europe scenario would be like a number of names that followed them for the better part of the last decade. But after, you know, strong returns, like 30% in one month, we decided to take some off the table and we will revisit once we think valuations are more compelling. So now looking at the, uh, the snapshot of the fund in terms of the constituents and performance, on the top right corner, you'll see our compounded returns. So since inception, we've returned about 11.3%. And according to Morningstar in 2019, we were the number one infrastructure fund in Canada. And thus far in 2020, again, according to Morningstar, we are tracking as a first decile fund. So the performance has continued from a very strong start in 2019 into 2020. And we obviously believe that's going to continue to the future because of our differentiated offering and the fact that we are benchmark agnostic and focusing on opportunities that our competitors are not necessarily looking at. But to speak a little bit to what Dennis mentioned earlier about the distribution and tax efficiency, thus far in 2020, a year where you've had hundreds, if not thousands of companies cut their distributions, the Starlight Global Infrastructure Fund has had more than 24 distribution increases at an average of roughly 10%. And that's a function not of companies borrowing debt to pay out dividends, but it's a function of these companies being able to grow their cash flows because a lot of it is regulated. They have in inflation indexed contracts. And a lot of these companies provide essential daily services where you're just not seeing much volatility in the cash flows when you compare and contrast that with more cyclical sectors that have got a bid in the last few weeks. But again, many of them have cut their dis distributions and have not provided guidance on when they're going to repay them. So we think in 2021, that trend is going to continue and dividend and distribution increases has always been a cornerstone of the infrastructure investment thesis. And looking at the top 10 portfolio holdings, uh, I won't touch on too many because we've discussed a few, but I'll talk about Switch Inc. And this again is a way that we try to differentiate ourselves because Switch is a small mid cap pure play data center in the US. Um, and what's interesting about the name is that they rank amongst the top decile in terms of AFFO growth, capacity growth, revenue growth, yet they rank in the bottom quartile in terms of valuation. And we think that's a function of liquidity being a smaller name. It's not classified as a REIT, so it's not as familiar, but that's really where we try to differentiate ourselves. We, we do the homework, we look for names that are outside consensus, outside benchmark, and we think that valuation disconnect is going to resolve itself as Switch continues to execute on their growth platform. And also the company this year increased their dividend 70%. And this is the company that actually is an under levered balance sheet. So that gives you an idea of the robust cash flow generation that you're getting from a name like Switch. So look into 2021. I mean, I'm going to echo some of the things I've already said, but maybe just give a little bit of a different perspective. And with respect to energy, we think it remains challenged. You know, if you talk to me at the beginning of October, I would have said, you know, the, the risk reward looks a little bit more compelling here. But again, after such a a robust October, November in terms of performance, now the risk reward to us looks more skewed to the downside. And just today, OPEC Plus announced that they're actually going to increase, or sorry, they're going to taper some of their uh, production cuts from 7.7 .7 million barrels per day to 7.2 million barrels per day starting in January. And this really is the challenge that energy faces, because on one hand, you have the hope that demand comes back with the vaccine rollout and COVID going away. But if that happens, then supply is gonna come back online because prices are gonna be higher and you have 7 million barrels that are sitting idle. So really, you know, they're, they're do, damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. And that's a situation where we prefer to allocate capital elsewhere where you're not dependent on Saudi Arabia and Russia coming to an agreement in the closed, uh, closed environment in Vienna. And when we look within industrials, transport industrials will continue to face a challenging recovery in 2021. Like I mentioned before, international business travel remains much lower than pre-COVID levels. And in an in a environment where people are working from home now 
And we've actually proven that a lot of work can get done from remote locations, not requiring travel. Businesses are going to look at it as a margin opportunity where they don't necessarily have to travel three, four, five times a month. And maybe they go to once a quarter. And that obviously will dampen the impact on things like airports. Instead, within industrials, we want to focus on companies providing essential daily services like waste collection and air cargo, where you do have some cyclicality. But at the end of the day, regardless of what happens with the vaccine, whether it's positive or negative, most people are still going to put out their garbage and that garbage is still going to need to be collected. Within renewables and utilities, echoing what I said before is that renewables, while we think have a tremendous growth opportunity ahead of them, there is challenges when it comes to valuation because I don't want to pay up for a company that's looking at 20 or 30 years of backlog paying up for that today. I'd rather invest in a company where I'm paying for the underlying assets that are producing cash flows and giving them maybe a little bit of credit for that growth. So that's where stock selections will become key. And we really want to focus on offshore wind and utility scale uh, solar, which have really been driven by governments trying to reduce carbon emissions and green their fleet, so to speak. Regulated utilities, an area where I haven't been that excited historically because of valuation, is, is a place where it's underperformed this year and will provide defensible cash flows in 2021. And the growth is going to be underpinned by electric network investments and maintenance and upgrading of infrastructure. And a, you know, a state like California is a great example where some of those transmission lines are more than 50 or 60 or 70 years old and they're causing wildfires. So a tremendous amount of investment is needed to bolster the, the equipment and ensure that they're not providing safety hazards. And lastly, with Infratech, again, we were talking about data centers, cellular towers, payment processors, and the secular tailwind supporting these companies like cloud computing, digitization of the economy, the build out of 5G networks, cashless payments. Those, those have actually all been strengthened by the COVID-19 crisis, and we don't believe those trends are going to reverse anytime soon, if ever. And that obviously gives us confidence in investing in these names for the next three, four or five years. But with that being said, as I said before, the large cap and protect names have done phenomenally well this year, especially those in the US. And that's an area where we're actually focusing more on the small mid cap space and globally, because we think valuations are more reasonable and the competitive dynamics are simply not as intense as the US market. And now I'll pass it on to Michelle to discuss real estate. Thank you. Sorry, I just need Kristen to start my video. She's uh, stopped it. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I just want to echo what's already been said, and I hope everyone's doing well, and my thoughts are with all of you and your families through this difficult time. So COVID-19 has had a material impact on the real estate sector, greater than that of the global financial crisis. COVID directly impacts the demand for space through quarantines, social distancing, shutdowns, supply chain disruptions, and employment losses. Rarely has there been such volatility and bifurcation in performance by property type. Each property type faces unique challenges. Some are very severe, like retail and hotel, and others are actually benefiting from COVID, such as industrial, data centers, and cell towers. The good news is that going into COVID-19, the Starlight Global Real Estate Fund was largely focused on sectors with long-term secular growth trends and didn't need to make drastic changes to our portfolio. However, I wanna highlight how we were actively managing the portfolio. First, we reduced our exposure to office and smaller cap REITs. We didn't have a lot of exposure to offices, some in the West Coast US and in Germany, However, we felt that work from home and the expectation of corporations deferring any major real estate decisions until after a vaccine would ultimately weigh on office valuations. We eliminated the exposure to lease up and more cyclical business models. We increased our exposure to sectors with long-term secular growth, including data centers and cell towers. We also increased our exposure to multifamily residential REITs and industrial REITs as fiscal stimulus and lockdowns supported cash flows. And lastly, we focus the portfolio on countries with significant fiscal capacity with which to support corporate revenues and household income. I want to highlight four contributors, contributors to our performance in 2020. The first is Goodman Group, who is one of the world's largest industrial property owners with operations throughout Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Europe, United Kingdom, North America, and Brazil with more than $50 billion of assets under management. 
Goodman's outperformance can be attributed to strong 2020 earnings with EPS of over 11% year over year and favorable 2021 guidance, as well as their growing development pipeline. The significant demand for logistics assets is driving up rental rates while compressing cap rates, which together should result in a strong total return in 2021. The second is Safehold, which is the only publicly traded REIT focused exclusively on ground leases. With a total addressable market of $7 trillion, we believe the company remains well positioned for outsized growth versus the broader REIT space over the next several years. The strength and quality of SAFE's portfolio through diversification and seniority is exemplified by the collection of 100% of runs during COVID and 84% earnings per share growth year over year generated in Q3. We believe SAFE generates superior returns versus similar risk and similar maturity fixed income securities due to its 2% annual lease escalations benefiting its weighted average lease term of 89 years. Thirdly is Winovia, who is the largest publicly traded European landlord with over 415,000 apartments focused on low and medium incomes across Germany, Austria, and Sweden. COVID has had relatively no impact on the portfolio with rent collections unchanged year over year and very close to 100%, which showcases the resiliency of its cash flow. Renovia's outperformance can be attributed to its solid fundamentals, as well as increased guidance for 2020 and strong initial 2021 guidance. We expect German residential to continue to outperform given a significant housing shortage and the expectation that population will rise on the back of immigration as Germany recovers from COVID at a faster pace than the rest of Europe. Lastly, Alexandria Real Estate Equities is the only publicly traded REIT focused solely on life science space. Although Alexandria is considered an office REIT, we argue that it's very different, notably that many of its tenants cannot work from home. Collections remain high at an impressive 99% of rents as healthcare and life sciences are deemed essential and other tenants are generally larger and well capitalized. We believe Alexandria is benefiting from secular tailwinds and will see stronger demand for life science buildings post COVID. Researchers are making key advancements in complex drug research that needs to be performed at real estate with dedicated infrastructure. These drugs also require more specialized manufacturing and therefore the companies prefer to have all aspects of their business nearby, increasing overall demand in and around the core life science cluster market. Next slide, please. The Starlight Global Real Estate Fund is concentrated in sectors with positive long-term structural drivers, many of which have actually benefited from COVID-19, such as industrial REITs, data centers, and cell towers. Neither data center nor cell tower REITs are available in Canada, and so the global nature of the Starlight Global Real Estate Fund provides investors with access to sectors that do not exist in Canada. The fund has zero weight in direct retail, seniors housing and hotels and a minimal strategic allocation to office. Real estate benchmarks are heavily weighted towards the retail and diversified sectors, which have been negatively impacted by COVID and have underperformed. We did not see great value or long-term growth in these sectors prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and fundamentals in both sectors have only deteriorated since. Next slide, please. The Starlight Global Real Estate Fund is a concentrated portfolio of great businesses purchased when they offer sufficient return for the risk incurred. This proprietary investment process has resulted in high active share of over 85% and an outperformance versus our benchmark both year to date and since inception. The Starlight Global Real Estate Fund provides a monthly distribution with an annualized yield of 5.6% as at November 30th. We revisit the distribution annually and actually increase the distribution by 8% in 2020 with a targeted annual yield of 5%. In 2019, 87% of the distribution was treated as return of capital for tax purposes, making the distribution very tax efficient for investors. For comparison, to earn the same after-tax yield, you would need to find equities yielding over 8% or bonds yielding over 12. In 2019, the Starlight Global Real Estate Fund experienced 30 dividend or distribution increases with an average rate at an average rate of 6.4% and had two companies initiate dividends. And while many companies have suspended or reduced distributions, the Starlight Global Real Estate Fund has had 22 distributions, distribution increases year to date 
at an average rate of 6.3%. Our top 10 holdings at the end of November consist largely of multi-residential REITs where we see the most compelling opportunity today, with many of these names trading at significant discounts to their net asset values, despite strong fundamentals and operating results, as well as specialized REITs, data centers, and towers, and a specialty industrial REIT focused on cold storage in Alexandria, who I spoke about earlier, which focuses on life sciences. Next slide, please. Over the past three weeks, I have met with over 40 global real estate companies, and I would characterize the management teams as moderately more bearish than compared to Q3 earnings just a few weeks ago. Although the recent vaccine news has provided a light at the end of the tunnel for some of the hardest hit REIT sectors, the rising COVID cases and deaths is likely to cause significant near-term economic pain, especially if businesses are forced to shut down again. So while the vaccine provides hope, most don't know what to expect between now and availability, leaving 2021 as another year of uncertainty. We don't believe the lasting impact of COVID-19 will be a 180 degree change in human behavior, but more of an acceleration of the trends that were already taking place. Real estate in a post-COVID world can be separated into three categories. The first is property sectors with continued tailwinds. Second, sectors with short-term COVID impacts, but strong recovery potential. And third, sectors with longer-term uncertainty. At Starlight Capital, we will continue to focus on quality and growth. We see the retail sector as being the most negatively impacted by COVID and the acceleration of e-commerce. We do not expect online shopping habits to reverse meaningfully post a vaccine. Office is a bit of a wild card today. We believe there will be some long-term impact, uh, long impact to demand from work from home, but ultimately we think the lasting impact will be more of an emphasis on flexibility rather than the home replacing the office. However, with COVID cases accelerating and bankruptcies on the rise, the recovery will likely take longer. Multi-residential REITs are poised to deliver strong earnings and net asset value growth driven by strong fundamentals and operating results. We see the sector as providing compelling returns as the valuations continue to trade at a discount. Industrial REITs have benefited from the e-commerce trend for a few years now. However, COVID has accelerated this trend about two to three years of an approximately 10 year formation. So we see continued strong secular tailwinds continuing in the future. Data centers and cell towers have benefited from secular long-term trends, a part, for, a part of the digital transformation. However, these tailwinds have been accelerated by COVID and the need to invest in digital infrastructure. Seniors housing continues to face elevated expenses and occupancy pressures with the acceleration of COVID and flu season. In the healthcare sector, we are seeing significant institutional interest for life sciences and medical office space where fundamentals and operations are very strong. We see secular tailwinds for the healthcare sector as the gray tsunami approaches. So to conclude, the Starlight Global Real Estate Fund provides investors with regular tax efficient monthly income and a capital appreciation tied to the long-term growth of technology and the mean reversion of apartment REIT valuations. We believe there's a compelling opportunity to generate strong risk-adjusted returns from global real estate. And now is the time we should be investing. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Varun, as well. Just to summarize, uh, our expectation and our outlook for the global economy is low growth, low inflation, and low rates, all of which support current real, real asset valuations and uh, we expect the total returns out of real assets to be supported by long-term macro trends that will accelerate cash flow growth. We highlight the tax efficient income generated by real assets and uh, the consistent growth to drive long-term outperformance. One point that we didn't really make during the presentation was that institutions continue to flow funds into real assets and their source of funds continues to be fixed income, especially with long-term interest rates uh, at historic lows and from cyclical assets. And we point out that uh, materials and energy now make up less than 4% of the S&P 500. That continues to be a source of funds for real asset allocations. Our track record speaks for itself, both at Starlight and at previous uh, asset management firms. We have a long track record of delivering strong risk adjusted returns with high active share and demonstrated downside protection. And finally, we give investors in Canada exposure to asset classes that don't exist in Canada.
And so with that, I will turn things back over to Lou for the Q&A portion of tonight's call. Thank you, Dennis, uh, Bruno, Michelle. A uh, number of questions have come in uh, that we've answered a, a few of them, but a uh, question surrounding it's uh, on the infrastructure side, views on uh, ENC companies uh, with uh, increased spending in infrastructure in 2021. Uh, is there an opportunity for engineering and construction companies? So I'll, I'll, I'll pass that question on to Varun. Sure. So uh, with ENC companies, we don't really classify them as infrastructure. Really, they're a beneficiary of infrastructure spend. But when you look at the cash flows and the business model, uh, it doesn't really resonate with how, what we define as infrastructure. And I'll give you an example in that if you have an ENC company that is bidding on an airport project, for example, LaGuardia's uh, terminal expansion in New York, uh, while that's going to be a great contract and they will take some risk on in terms of cost overruns, once that terminal is built, they don't have any interest in, in the terminal's cash flows. We'd rather own the airport company or the toll road company that actually owns the underlying concession, receives those cash flows and gets the benefit from things like population growth, uh, inflation indexation, higher utilization. That's really the infrastructure-like characteristics we like to see versus ENC is, is constantly a battle of getting more projects and more projects to fill in the backlog, but they're not actually getting ownership of assets and collecting those cash flows, which is what we view as the infrastructure component of the assets. Thank you. Uh, while I have you, Varun, uh, 5G is is talked, of, talked about a lot. What are the implications in 2021 uh, for infrastructure spending uh, with, with regards to uh, 5G? Sure. So 5G it has a lot of hype around it. And I think when you, when you look into it, you realize that it's going to take a lot longer to build out the network. And it's going to be, um, you know, a lot of different technologies that people are not necessarily understanding today. So 5G can be a number of different frequencies. And the most impressive one is called millimeter wave where you can get 900 or 1,000 megabits per second. But that particular technology is very susceptible to interference. And as a result, to build out a network of a millimeter wave 5G frequency is going to take four, five, six years, and it's going to require a lot of urban investment in what's called uh, small cells, which are basically little towers that go into cities to help to deal with that interference. So think of a, a place like New York City, which is just a ton of tall buildings. You cannot rely on the infrastructure we have today that does LTE because 5G uh, millimeter wave will not be able to cross across all these large buildings and trees and obstacles. So when we look at the opportunity, we want to focus on names that are not only going to benefit from the cellular tower business, but also from the small cell business. And that leads us to a name like Crown Castle. I actually recently pitched it on BNN. Um, and Crown Castle is kind of positioned well because they not only have the traditional tower business, where you're going to have cell, uh, cellular companies putting on their equipment, but they're also very active in small cell and fiber. So in places like New York, London, uh, Toronto, where you're going to have a lot of issues with interference, they're going to bolster those networks by investing in small cells. And that's really going to be a big advantage for 5G versus 4G uh, in terms of the capital amount spent and the growth pipeline that these guys are going to benefit from over the next several years. But one thing I'll caution investors in that, 5G is going to take a lot longer than people expect, and it's not going to be as good as people think it's going to be until the tail end of the build out for the reasons I've mentioned. So that in turn is actually a good thing for infrastructure because we're looking at multi-year growth rather than, you know, one or two years of elevated CapEx. You would expect 5G spend to, to go on for at least the next five years. Thank you. Uh, for Michelle or Dennis, uh... With, reg with regards to REITs, November saw a bounce back for a number of REITs that were hit hard at the beginning of, uh, of the year. Uh, do you see this rebound as sustainable and continuing into 2021? So I'll let Michelle take that question. Sure, thanks, Leo. That's a great question. Um, you know, what really happened and what was we referred to in our presentation was a bit of a hope trade with the vaccine news. But really what you saw rebounding in November was sectors that had been very hard hit. So these are your retail, your seniors housing, your hotel. Um, but what we argue that a lot of these industries, especially the retail industry, were really struggling prior to even COVID. So these were not names that we were looking to enter and we did not purchase going into this rally. Um, we just feel that these names have uh, you know, structural headwinds that are gonna continue and persist 
even outside of COVID. And a lot of these structural trends that are that are impacting retail, for example, are going to continue even after a vaccine is is surrounded. So, um, you know, our best advice on that would be to uh, take your profits because we see a lot of potential downside in some of these means to come because of the economic fallout. Yeah, and the, the one thing I would add to what Michelle said was that uh, we just completed earnings season. So we have a pretty clear picture of how the actual operations are, are, are panning out for various subsectors in the real estate space. And, you know, Michelle highlighted the fact that we've got an overweight in multi-residential. The reason for that is that despite the fact that they reported, we saw significant distribution increases. One of our multi-res positions increased their distributions just two days ago. They've increased, they've written up the value of their real estate as a function of yes, cap rates continuing to stay neutral, stay at low levels, but cash flow growth underpinning the increase in value of the real estate. They've, as I said, they've grown their distributions and the uh, occupancies are already at high levels. The one sort of chink in the armor was the concerns around uh, immigration. Of course, with the pandemic, we've shut the border down to all you know non-Canadians uh, and unessential travel. Uh, but the federal government came out last month and made it clear that not only will they resume our aggressive immigration targets, but they will actually increase them to make up for um, lost immigrants, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, during the pandemic. So the fundamentals remain robust for multi-res, and the sector trades at a material sort of 10 to 15 percent discount to net asset value. Now compare that to some of the sectors that have had a renaissance, as if you will, in November, retail, in the reporting, what we've seen is the value of real estate continuing to be written down, uh, cash flows continuing to come under pressure, and relatively lower collection rates. And of course, you know, Michelle Varun, myself and Lou are all based in Ontario. Um, we've returned to lockout in various regions and municipalities within the province of Ontario. The Atlantic Canadian bubble, where if you were resident in one of the four maritime provinces, you could travel between them without sheltering in place. That bubble has, of course, now been broken, as we've seen cases in each one of the maritime provinces. So you can see the resurgence of COVID-19 is going to continue to uh, cast a pall over the returns of retail real estate. So to echo Michelle's sentiments, why would we want to allocate capital to a sector where the value is deteriorating and the outlook in the short term to medium term from the virus is continued negativity to go along with the longer term thesis of negativity, when we can continue to allocate capital to a sector that is uh, trading at below net asset value, and those net asset values are actually increasing and underscored by increasing distributions and cash flows. So that's our take on sort of what's taken place in November. Uh, with respect to distributions, the question just came in, uh, do we anticipate making any uh, distribution changes to our REIT fund and then I'll add to, to our infrastructure fund going into 2021? So great question, uh, not something that we can answer implicitly. We would point out that when we launched both the Global Real Estate Fund and the Global Infrastructure Fund, we had targeted 5% yields. And with our in proprietary investment strategy that focuses on businesses that grow their cash flows and reward us with increasing distributions, we did increase the distributions in the infrastructure fund in January by, I believe, 14% and by 8% in the real estate fund. Um, that's as far as we can go in terms of providing forward guidance on the distributions out of the underlying mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, question for Varun, uh, if we're, we're comfortable in talking about uh, private equity investments inside the, the, your, your infrastructure fund, any comments on Opera that can be shared? Sure, sure. So um, it's actually very timely. I was just talking to the CEO of Opera. We have a call next week and then a board meeting. And uh, Opera, for those who aren't familiar, is a uh, what we call a digital infrastructure platform that connects different stakeholders and a number of industries, most importantly e-gaming, uh, and leverages that, uh, that platform to programmatically uh, grow both teams and influencer media and all types of different end markets uh, at scale. And the reason why we like a name like Opera, which at first glance you wouldn't think it's infrastructure, is because they are essentially a middleman that is facilitating the growth of an industry, both on the user end, the business end, and then also on the, on the game franchise end. And they do not own any content. They don't own any streaming platforms. They're simply a digital platform that sits on top of everything that is agnostic of any source that's coming through, whether it's you know Twitch or uh, Google Games or Riot Games. And as a result, they're able to monetize a lot of this business. Uh, and when you look at sports in general, uh, e-gaming is growing faster than anything else. Like nothing even compares. But the monetization per user 
is only at around $5. You compare that to something like the NFL, NBA, MLB, and you're looking at 30, 30 to $60 per user. And that's really where we think offer event is going to make a difference in trying to monetize such a large market that's growing you know, at 30, 40, 50% year over year. So with respect to the investment itself, it's actually, they've been impacted by COVID a bit this year. Uh, but one thing I'll note is that the uh, the rate of growth in one of their areas called IGC is now exceeding about 100% from before we did the investment. So we are looking at some other opportunities for the company where they might be partnering uh, with Apple on becoming their preferred vendor on their App Store list. Um, but stay tuned for updates like that. I don't want to speak too much ahead of it, but Opera uh, thus far has gone well. And uh, we think, you know, in a few years from now, we'll be a ubiquitous name when it comes to the digital infrastructure needed to monetize the e-gaming space as well as a number of other end markets. And, and Lou, before we move to the next question, I'll, I'll ask Michelle if you want to speak briefly about the private investment in the real estate fund, IQHQ. Sure. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, yeah, so Dennis and I recently invested in a private company called IQHQ, and it follows on Alexandria Equities, which I spend a lot of time talking about in my presentation in the life sciences space. So the founder of IQHQ is actually one of the co-founders of Alexander Equities, has, as well as Biomed, which is Blackstone's um, life sciences uh, vehicle, and so has lots of deep experience in this space. Um, they're really targeting ground up development, which is really what needs to be done in the life sciences building. It's very difficult to take an office building and retrofit it to be proper lab space. Um, so we see an excellent opportunity for this company to generate really significant returns to the development of a lot of really high class life sciences buildings and the, the eventual uh, spin out of an IPO, hopefully in two to three years for this investment. So we've recently seen a number of transactions in the life sciences space at very attractive valuations, which should actually increase the value of our investment uh, towards year end. So it's been a great investment so far. And I would, I would just say that uh, in addition to the Starlight private pools that invest a significant amount of their capital in privates, we continue to do, do sorry, we continue to do due diligence on private opportunities for the mutual funds and ETFs as well. Excellent, thank you. Just being mindful of the time uh, that we've uh, we're sort of at the hour, um, we'll take, uh, it looks like there's one more question in here that's, that's come in. It, it feels almost planted though. Uh, institutional investors are, are, you talked about that, that have been pouring money into the real estate infrastructure, into real estate and infrastructure. Um, what percentage allocation to real assets would you recommend uh, for retail investors? Sure. Great question. And I can see the planted nature of it. Um, we've quoted Bruce Flatt uh, ad nauseum for the last year and a bit, going back to his Q3 letter to shareholders, where he talked about um, institutional investors globally increasing their real assets allocation from 25% currently to a 60% target. Uh, so that's one benchmark you can use. Uh, I think retail investors in Canada and of course, this is dependent on their personal situation. But I think given the low interest rate environment, the volatility you're seeing in equity markets, uh, I, think re I think retail investors in Canada should have at least 20% of their AUM in real assets for the stability, the transparency, the defensive nature, the cash flow growth, and the long-term outperformance. And then depending on age and risk tolerance, that allocation should only grow from there. And we'd be remiss if we didn't have a fresh quote from, from Bruce Flatt this year. And I, I should say Bruce Flatt is being the CEO of Brookfield Asset Management, a $500 billion plus real asset manager. Uh, earlier this year, Bruce Flatt commented that uh, the infrastructure market is poised to overtake the real estate market globally in terms of size and, and capital allocated to it. So as large as the global real estate market is and how integral it is to investors' portfolios, infrastructure is the potential to even surpass that market in size and scale. So either way you look at it, real assets is a sector where institutional investors have high allocations, rising allocations, and this is really an area for retail investment investors to catch up um, to benefit from those tax efficient distributions and the longer term capital appreciation. Uh, and then we'll, 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 we'll end with sort of two thoughts here for Varun and Michelle and uh, ladies first. So Michelle, uh, quickly, maybe the, your, the biggest uh, tailwind for real, for real estate into 2021. 
The biggest tailwind for real estate in 2021 is going to be consistent growing cash flow. And I think that's what investors need to see. So that's investing in sectors like industrial, that's data centers, that's towers that have the secular consistent growth. Because that's going to that's going to mean rising underlying cash flows and growing distributions to shareholders, um, and that's the consistency that the market needs to see in such an uncertain time. Um, and so that's you know as well as sectors like multifamily, where you're seeing those uh, compelling opportunities on a disconnect. As we see private market transactions happening in the marketplace today, that are going to ha- help to eliminate that NAV discount. So that's where we see the most kind of compelling opportunities going into 2021 today. Thank you, Barun. Same question. Biggest tailwind for infrastructure going into 2021. Sure. So you can tell we uh, have a similar investment philosophy at Star Lake because I was going to talk about cash flow too. But um, I, I would say the the most important thing and the biggest tailwind for infrastructure in 2021 is going to be growth, regardless of what happens with COVID-19. And the reason why I say that is we we have no certainty on when we reach herd immunity. If there's a second wave, third wave, fourth wave, all of that is unknown. But what we do know is that our names are going to grow regardless of what path the COVID-19 crisis takes. Hopefully, it's the best path possible where we get a vaccine out, it's rolled out, and herd immunity is, a, is achieved. But in that kind of environment, things like waste collection, things like data centers and cellular towers, they are going to benefit. If anything, you're going to have accelerated investment in a number of these end markets that are already being accelerated because of the crisis, and that will continue even when the crisis subsides. Things like utilities as well, where, I mean, renewables being another good example, is that that's not going to change regardless of what happens with the crisis. And that is a secular trend that now is in place for the next five to 10 years. And there was a question on the uh, on the panel, I think, talking about valuations and renewables and things like that. And one thing to keep in mind is that stock selection is going to be very important in 2021. And I think I speak on behalf of Michelle and Dennis as well, in that you don't want to pay up for growth that's five, 10 years out. And that's what you're seeing with a lot of these renewable names globally, Orsted being a good example, the Danish offshore wind developer where you're paying basically for the next 20 years of growth. And that's an area where I think we're gonna differentiate ourselves from our competitors and even the benchmark in that all three of us focus on stock selection, on the merits of each individual investment and whether they can grow their cash flows, like Michelle said, and whether they can weather the storm regardless of what curveball we're sent in 2021. But Hopefully it's an optimistic curveball and everything works out. And in that case, we'll benefit. But if it isn't, we're still positioned defensively to navigate the next crisis whenever it does come. Thank you. That's uh, uh, all of our questions. Dennis, uh, any final thoughts? Uh, Again, just uh, recognizing that everyone is busy and uh, family time is at a premium. So want to thank everybody for joining us on their call tonight, making us part of their evening, giving us the opportunity to compete for your business. Happy holidays and please stay safe. So with that, uh, I echo Dennis and thank you, uh, Dennis, for and Michelle for your, for your perspectives and your insights. Uh, we will have a replay of, uh, of our webcast that will be available uh, via private YouTube channel that we will share with you. If you do need further information or have any other questions, please contact your Starlight Capital sales team member or please email me directly at lrusso at starlightcapital.com. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. All the best.